Well, let us open the Word of God together to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and we'll see, we'll, we won't sing, we will read. <laughs> we will read Romans chapter 1. Uh, isn't that wonderful when you sing the Word of God? You, get, you, make, that, um, you make that mistake sometimes. Uh, so Romans chapter 1, we'll read together from uh, verse 18 to verse uh, 23. Romans chapter 1, uh, reading from verse 18. Uh, to verse uh, 23. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, They became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And so reads uh, the word of God uh, to us uh, this day. Well, last time in our series on the book of Romans, we looked at the subject of the wrath of God and we looked uh, at a number of things uh, quite a lot actually in in that message Uh, we covered quite a lot of ground and um, uh, we noted that verse 18 begins a a new section of uh, this book which goes up to chapter 3 and verse 20 we also noticed that this is where where Paul begins his gospel Presentation. Now, some might say, well, hold on, in verses 16 and 17, we have a declaration of the gospel. But that is a, a statement from Paul's perspective of his position. It's really in verse 18 uh, where he begins to present the gospel message in its fullness. And he begins with the subject of the wrath of God. People need to know why they need to be saved. It's no good going to people and telling them, uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, if they don't realize what they are being saved from. So therefore he begins with this um, declaration of the wrath of God in verse 18. We also noted last time that this is not a vague presentation of God this is very clear a lot of people don't want a God who is clear they want some sort of vague notion of of God but they don't want specifics especially they don't want the specifics of the God of the Bible that is not the God they want we also noted last time that this is a great motivation for evangelism in fact The two great motivations for evangelism are the glory of God and the salvation of men and indeed women. We also looked at three attitudes to God's wrath. The attitude of the unbeliever is simply to reject it. Uh, The attitude of the liberal is to explain it away. And the attitude of some evangelicals is to ignore it even though they give lip service Uh, to the doctrine of the wrath of God. They never preach on it in any clear way. They would never give a message. They would say it's too negative. We need to present the love of God and so on. A bit like the liberals, uh, the same attitude. In fact, liberalism is growing more and more within evangelicalism. uh, And that is a great tragedy, of course. Then we saw briefly how Paul presents this doctrine through the book. And we, we showed ten references Uh, and ten different aspects of the wrath of God and how it affects uh, man. 
Then we ask a number of questions. What is meant by the wrath of God? How is the wrath of God revealed? Against what is the wrath of God revealed? And so on. And that's just a brief overview of what we looked at last time. Now this morning we come to the subject which really follows on from the wrath of God and it's the sort of the the, uh, the other side of the coin if you like which is the guilt of man. The doctrine of the wrath of God would be no problem if we were completely innocent. <laughs> you know it's uh, if you're driving down the road and you've uh, got no insurance, no tax, no NCT in your car and you see the guard at the checkpoint what happens? Panic we're going to turn off, but if you've got your full NCT, your tax, your insurance, everything's in order, you can go, ah, no problem. And the Word of God says that the, the, that the, um, uh, the forces of the state are no fear to those who are uh, innocent or those who are, who are not guilty, if you like. So the wrath of God is a problem because we are guilty. We stand guilty before God. Why? Because of our sin. Our sin has made us guilty. And therefore the two subjects, the wrath of God and the guilt of man, are very serious subjects uh, for us. Now let's say this before we go any further. If these things were not true, these would be horrible subjects to consider. If these things were not reality, we would be terrible people even bringing them up. You know, to tell somebody that they are dying of cancer if they're not is a a terrible thing but if you tell somebody they have a serious disease when they have it well then you're telling them so hopefully they might get some cure so this morning if we are bringing up these things and these things don't exist well then we are the worst people in the world but if these things do exist if God's wrath is real and the guilt of man is real, when then we are the people who are most needed in this world from a human perspective. We will see in our passage this morning that the guilt of man is based upon his wrong relationship to God. You see, sin is not like, as some people think, just something wrong in us. You know, we've got a problem the sin problem is just something, you know, a bad way of thinking or, you know, a bad heart or whatever. No, sin is the wrong relationship we have with God. In other words, we are not obedient to God. We are disobedient to God. That's the problem. That's why we are guilty. Not because we have uh, something in us that's bad, but because we have a wrong relationship Uh, towards God. Of course sin is in us but that is not the main problem. The main problem is we are those who have broken God's law and that's where we stand this morning by nature. We're going to see four main points um, uh, this morning um, in in our message. First of all we get straight into the man is guilty because of his relationship to God in regard to the truth of God. In regard to the truth of God, man is guilty. Verse 1, chapter 18 reads, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, some modern translations translate that as suppress the truth, and there's no doubt that is Uh, one of the meanings but so often as is the case in the authorized version there's more than one meaning suppression of the truth is there but it's more than that in other words it's not that people are coming out in the open saying we are against the word of god yes that is what some people do but quite often there's a whole lot of other people who pretend To hold to the truth of God. But they do it in an unrighteous manner. They give lip service to God. They say they believe in God, but they deny the power thereof, as Paul writes to Timothy. They profess that they know me, but in works what? They deny me. You see, it's not good enough, is it, to hold the truth? 
we must hold the truth in righteousness. We must hold to the truth in a righteous way. We must submit to God. We must obey God. We must follow God according to His truth. It's obvious those who suppress the truth outwardly. What's not obvious is those who claim to believe in the Bible. One of the arguments that we've given for going through the confession of faith, and one of the problems that we see in many modern evangelical churches is this, that you read their statement of faith and you could, you'd almost write it on one side of an A4 page. It's, it's lip service. It's, it's too basic. Sorry, that's probably ungracious. I don't mean that it's lip service. And, and, and it, what I mean, it's, I, I, I'll take that, that back if you don't mind. It's, it's, it's too basic. Why? Because we need to be uh, very, very uh, definitive in what we mean when we say we believe in the Bible. It's not good enough just to say, give a, a brief answer. There's too many people who say they believe in the word of God. We have to be definitive. We have to be absolutely clear in what we mean when we say the Bible is the word of God. And I believe it. John chapter 3 verse 19 and 20 (coughs) reads, This is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. That's the reason why they don't want to believe. It's not an academic, it's not a mental thing, it's because they are sinners. Because we are sinners, we don't want the light, we don't love the light. Why? Because our, our hearts are evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. That's why we need to read the Bible daily, isn't it? It's why we need to read the Word of God constantly. So we can see more light in us. So we can shine that light into every crevice of what we are as people. In fact, for the believer, we rejoice when the Scripture exposes another problem. Because we have an opportunity to get closer to God in that area as the children of God we should never be afraid of the word of God exposing another area of sin it just gives us a further opportunity to be closer to God but the world doesn't want that the world hates turning on the light it's almost like you know if you um, know someone's coming to your house and the house is a bit of a mess and you know, panic. <laughs> panic sets in, you know. And it's like, how much time do we have? Well, we have a half an hour. Can we do it? You know, and sometimes we're like that with the Word of God, aren't we? We know things are a mess. And sometimes we might say to ourselves, I just won't turn on the light. I just don't want to look. I just don't want to see it. I don't want God or I don't want to see the problem. I want to ignore it. That's why, how do I know if I'm backsliding? How much are you reading the Word of God? That's the answer. It's, you can equate it, can't you, really? I mean, that's, that is the answer. Oh, I'm backsliding now for three weeks. Well, you know, I haven't read the Word of God. There's the answer. That's why I'm backsliding. I think, I could be wrong on this, but uh, by almost 28 years of experience, it's impossible to backslide if you're constantly reading the Word of God. I think it's impossible. I could be wrong. But practically I've experienced that when I'm reading the word of God on a day-to-day basis, I don't backslide. It's when I stop turning on the light and exposing the evil of my own heart, that's when I backslide. Job describes uh, such people uh, who hate the truth of God in this way. They are of those that rebel against the light. Job 24.13 They know not the ways thereof, nor abide In the paths thereof. They don't want it. They rebel. They know not. And they don't abide it. So man is guilty. First of all because of his relationship. And how he handles. The truth of God. But secondly. Man is guilty. Because of his relationship. To the knowledge of God. 
Verse 19 reads, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. The word manifest uh, there is the Greek word that means apparent. It's shining. It's obvious. It's clear. It's right in front of you. You can't miss it. It is, if you like, the elephant in the room. It just can't be ignored. John chapter 1 verse 9, that was the true light which lighted every man. There's a sense in which every man has this light to some degree that cometh into the world. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not. It's like a blind man and there's a big table in, in, in the room and he walks into the table because he's blind. It's, it's not that the problem is in the lack of light in the room. The problem is the darkness in his eyes. And we often have this experience, don't we, with unbelievers. We look up at the same sky. We look up at the same sun. And they see an accident. And we see the glory of God. The problem is not in the evidence. The problem is in the one who was looking at the evidence. It says in our, in our verse, For God hath showed it unto them. See, God hasn't failed here. God has showed it. God has revealed it to them. God has manifested it to them. Acts 14, in verse 15, we read, The living God, this is Paul at Iconium, The living God which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways, nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. The very reality of nature was a witness, a sufficient witness that God was a good God. So man is guilty because of his relationship to the knowledge of God. But notice in our verse, it also says, in them. It's manifest in them. So it's not just the outward creation. It is not just nature. It is, again, this idea of conscience that we mentioned last Wednesday evening. There's enough knowledge in their very conscience. But again, what's the problem? Not that God hasn't given them a conscience, but that that conscience has been suppressed, has been ignored. I remember even before I was converted, I knew what sin was. I knew the, we all know, and and that's why the Puritan, one Puritan said, the knowledge of sin is not a sufficient evidence of salvation. Even to some degree of the conviction of sin is not a a full uh, evidence of salvation. For that conscience has been given to all people. That knowledge of sin has been given to all. It's whosoever confesseth and forsaketh his sin shall have the mercy of God. Just to confess sin is not a full evidence of salvation. For all of us did that even before conversion. Even before we were saved. We must, and that's why I like the prayers. It's amazing in the providence of God, isn't it? The prayers, how God has made sin less and less beautiful in our eyes. I can't remember the exact words that was prayed by Rowan and Adam, but that them ideas come across, that, that we're more and more realizing the ugliness of sin, the depravity of our own hearts, which enables us to forsake sin. It's one of the prayers you need to pray, isn't it? We all need to pray. Lord, help me to truly hate sin. To truly hate everything that you hate. So man is guilty because of his relationship to the truth of God, the knowledge of God, and thirdly, man is guilty because of his relationship to the evidence for God. Verse 20. For the invisible things of him, 
from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Again, the problem is not in the evidence. Being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are, what? Without excuse. Man is guilty because of his relationship to the evidence for God. What is the evidence pointing to? Notice it says, the invisible things of him. His very power, his very nature. It is pointing to him. Everything. You look up at the stars. You look up into the sky during the day. This is declaring The invisible power of God. What we can't see is being revealed. It's a a sense in which what Jesus does in coming, He revealed the invisible God. Nature itself reveals. It's the stamp. It is the declaration of the invisible God. But secondly, what are the invisible things of Him? The end of the verse tells us, even his eternal power and Godhead, his divinity, as some modern translations uh, put it. Thirdly, when did this evidence appear? From the creation of the world. It's always been there. Right from day one, it has been there. I learned uh, um, a few years ago, and you know the way you learn something, you go, wow. Had a wow moment. Do you all know what the word universe means? Now maybe you probably say, well, hold on, everyone knows that. Do you know what the word universe means? One word. Uni one verse. That's what the universe is. God spoke it into existence. It's God's word. It's the, it's the revealing of God's word. God said and it was so. That was a well moment. I mean, that's, that's amazing, isn't it? So the evolutionists should change the word. You should no longer call it the universe. Gill notes, This is no new discovery. But what men have had and might by the light of nature have enjoyed ever since the world was created. But then fourthly, how good is this evidence? How good is this evidence? It says, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. It's good evidence. There's nothing wrong with the evidence. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. There's nothing wrong with the evidence. Day unto day uttereth speech. Night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Do you know what the word declare means there in the Hebrew? It means to inscribe. It's like God has inscripturated His eternal power across the heavens. God is saying, this is what I am. This is who I am. Just look and you will see me. So why does man not believe it? Again, the problem is not in the evidence, but in man himself. Again, the answer is John 3. Men loved darkness rather than light. It's like what John Calvin said, if man was able... If man had the power, man would reach up into heaven and grab God by the throat and pull him off his throne. If man could do it, that's what man would do. That's what the devil tried to do. And that's what man would do if man was able. They loved darkness rather than light. And because they can't treat God that way, they often treat God's people that way. That's the closest that they can get. What did they do to Christ? There's no reason why he should have been treated that way. It says of of the Lord Jesus in Luke's Gospel, he just went about doing good. Here's the one who never sinned, never done anything wrong. And what did they do? They crucified him. If man could kill God, They would do it 
tomorrow. What is the consequence of the evidence? So that in our verse, they are without excuse. Some people say that they can't wait to see God, so they have a few things to tell them. Romans 3 verse 19 says that every mouth may be stopped. We know that what, what things the law say that say to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. See, all God's going to have to do with Judgment Day. I, I have this image of Judgment Day. Don't take this as absolute. This is my impression. Based on a biblical verse, it just says that in the day when God will reveal the secrets of men's hearts, God will say nothing. What he'll do is... He'll just allow man's hearts to be revealed. They'll have nothing to say then. They'll have nothing to say. They will have no argument. But then finally, man is guilty because of his relationship to the worship of God. Man is guilty because of his relationship to the worship of God. Our catechism states that man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We see this in verses 21, 23. Man's guilt here as well, verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, or as Martin Lloyd-Jones says, in their reasonings, they became vain in their reasonings, and their foolish heart was dark. And notice, first of all here, they had sufficient knowledge not to err or not to go wrong in the worship of God. Because that when they knew God, think about this even logically. Somebody in deepest, dark, darkest South America looks up at the, the heavens. And what does he do? He goes to a tree, shapes it into something and says, this is what made this. That is foolish. You don't need the gospel. And I say this reverently, to realize that's wrong. That is, the, the heart of man is so desperately wicked that even something so obvious, how could something like this be the creator of that? But secondly, they did not worship God according to his nature. They glorified him not as God, as who and what he is. They didn't give to him his proper glory. Can I just say again to bring this back very practically to us. This is why we have to be so careful in the worship of God. That we have to not go one iota away from what scripture commands. And we must never put ourselves in the position where we can decide what is allowable in God's worship. Because listen, our hearts are so desperately deceived, even in a saved position. We can't make those decisions. People will say to us, well, it's okay to sing this, to sing that. It it looks all right. It looks theologically correct. Is that the only concern? Is that the only issue? Is the only issue whereby we determine what we sing to God if it's theologically correct? Is God uh, a systematic theologian? Is that the only basis? See how deceived we can be in, in this area. God has told us to stick so carefully to his word because he has to be glorified as who he is. And the only thing that can glorify God and the only material that can truly glorify God as who he is, is this. It is his word. And we dare not go one step away from God's word and the worship of God. Because we can't be the adjudicators. We can't be the judges of what is acceptable in the worship of God. But then thirdly, not only did they not worship Him, but they didn't even thank Him. Neither were thankful. Psalm 100 verse 4, 
enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Psalm 92. By the way, uh, Psalm 92 is, is, is a psalm for the Sabbath day. And it's interesting. In verse 2 it says, To show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. That's why one of the reasons we have a morning and evening service. But look what verse 1 says. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. It's the last thing people do. People think we're funny, don't they? When we give thanks for our food. They think we're a bit weird. Although in, in Dunn's we were congratulated the other day, myself and Benjamin and Jason, uh, you know, which is nice. Um, but most people think it's strange. In fact, we were in... We were in one house one time, and we we said, would you mind if we give thanks for our food? And the person says, well, God didn't make that for you. I did. I said, yeah, but God made you. Amen. You know? <laughs> Second Timothy 3, this also know that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient, disobedient to parents, unthankful is put in there, just as important. I mean, we like to be thanked, don't we? If you do something for somebody, you like somebody to say, thanks. You know, if you've done a a wonderful work of art, a wonderful painting, if if Adam was to do a, a, a wonderful painting, and I was to go around to everybody and say, actually, that was an accident. Or actually, Adam didn't do that, Raymond did that, or somebody else did that. How would Adam feel? He would feel terribly grieved. What's the world saying when they're saying the whole of creation is not the work of God? They're not even thanking God for that. Every moment that we have breath in our bodies, every moment that we can stand, every moment that we have food in our bellies, we should be constantly giving thanks to God. How good is the God we adore, someone wrote. Our faithful, unchangeable friend. Fourthly, there's a consequence of this on themselves. Not just consequence in their attitude towards God, but a consequence on themselves. But became vain or empty in their imaginations, or as we said, in their reasonings. And their foolish heart was darkened. Ephesians 4 says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity or the emptiness of their mind, having the understanding darkened. Why? Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Their understanding is darkened because they are alienated from the life of God. In other words, true knowledge has to be connected to God. It has to be grounded in and get its life from the life of God. There is no true knowledge without God's life being in that knowledge. They think they're okay. But in verse 22 it says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. I mentioned uh, some time ago, um, the the man who wrote the man in the wheelchair um, Stephen Hawkins is that his name? Yeah. And I mentioned some time ago to some of you that there was a documentary that he did based on the book that he wrote. And the very end of the documentary, it's probably on YouTube. Never checked it, but you can check it up. At the very end of the documentary, the last thing he says, the very last sentence he says in the documentary, all this goes to show that there is no personal God. That was the sum total of his conclusion of his life not just the book book, but of his life professing themselves to be wise they became fools the fool had said in his heart there is no God Jeremiah 8 verse 9 the wise men are ashamed they are dismayed and taken lo they have rejected The word of the Lord. And what wisdom is in them? See what Jeremiah says? If they have rejected God's word, whatever they think, whatever wisdom they think they have, 
What type of wisdom rejects the Word of God? What type of wisdom lives outside of the Word of God? There was a, a scientific journal written uh, many years ago, and I, I, I only know this because I heard this quoted by another preacher, so don't ask me later on for references, I can't give it to you, but I'm quoting another preacher now. And back in the 50s, they actually discussed this issue where they actually started to realize that um, evolution had all sorts of problems scientifically. And in this scientific journal, it wasn't for public consumption, it was, it was one of these sort of internal journals that was written. And whoever wrote the journal said, well, we know that we have two options. We have evolution and creation. And we know creation, we can't accept that one. So we know how bad the, the problems are with evolution, but because it's all we have at the moment, that's what we're going to stick to. Just rejecting even the possibility of creation. But then, not only the consequence of this on themselves, look at their, the consequence of this on their treatment of God. Verse 23. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. They make themselves fools and then they make God foolish. It is a foolish thing. To think God is like man. The word of God says, I am not a man, God says, that I should lie. The word uncorruptible there means undecaying. God can't decay. He can't corrupt. He never changes. But what do they do? They change this glory of the uncorruptible, unchanging, undecaying God. And they bring him down like the corruptible man. And even worse, like a bird or a beast or a creeping thing. The word change there is not really, but perceptibly. In their perception, they change God. How they see him. Albert Barnes says, This does not mean that they literally transmuted God himself, but that in their views they exchanged him. Or they changed him as an object of worship for idols. They produced, of course, no real change in the glory of the infinite God. But the change was in themselves. They tried to change God. But they only make themselves more corrupt. He is the eternal. He is the unchangeable God. As Walter C. Smith once wrote, Immortal, invisible, God only wise. In light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days. Almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. To all life thou givest, to both great and small. In all life thou livest, the true life of all. We blossom and flourish as leaves on the tree and wither and perish. But not change at thee. May God enable us to see him this day in his unchanging, uncorruptible, Glory. Let us stand for prayer.